And action! I love it. <laughs> How excited are you? Me! Guess what we're doing today? You told I said me to meet me. you at the golf cart. You I know. said meet guess, me at the golf cart. Guess how excited you are. Me! I'm excited. Right, because you said meet me at the golf cart. I'm yes. like, what are we doing tonight? And she said, be there late night. Get ready for it. Mm -hmm. so what, what are you, where are we going? Well, first, let's say who we are, and then we can talk about the cool things that we're going to do, okay? Because, mm -hmm. hi, digital friends. Hi, digital friends. It's Leslie. Steve. And behind the camera we have Mindy. Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Zoo Adventures. Zoo Adventure team today. It's and awesome. it's a late Zoo Adventures because is. we're going to go looking for some animals. We're going batting today. I love baseball. I love batting cages. I love everything about it. You get there, you get... Steve. Steve. Yes. Batting. As opposed like, to fielding. Like batting. Not batting. I don't, know, I don't know if Steve's going to want to go anymore. That's though. why we're in the evening. Yes. <laughs> that's why you bribed me with dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I bribed you with bats, too. You know, you, I'm just, it's your fault you thought that they were baseball bats. Anyways, we are going to go, we are going to, uh, we participate. Um, you and I are going to participate in this really awesome um research program basically so we're doing cool. some community citizen science it's for, real science it is real science That's for awesome. in a bat or in a bat um oh, nice. where we've we're, we've been helping through the wildlife resource commission wildlife resource commission we're gonna go listen to some bats i love basically. it basically and did you guys hear that we're going to listen to bats mm -hmm. stay tuned mm -hmm. let's go all right, Steve, we're on our way. We go, are on our way. To go batting. Uh, I kind of got that wrong, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Sorry, that's guys. okay. I know you're very into baseball, so. I heard batting. I got stoked. I was like, <laughs> yes, batting. Even I can do that. And then I wasn't quite right on what this thought. By the way, so what, where are we headed again? We're headed to Rockingham, the town, not the county. So it's about, oh, about 50 minutes away from the zoo. Okay. And we're heading down there specifically because with this um, project, we have a very specific route we actually have to take. Oh. So you are gonna have to drive no more than 20 miles an hour. Can you do that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, also guess of what? We, we don't have cruise control. Oh. Good thing we have hazard signs. We do have hazard We can put our hazards, hazards, and then uh -huh. we'll have a little sign that says- Oh, I just wanna ask. We have some, okay, so, so people know what we're doing yes. around here. <laughs> But a little where, nervous there. <laughs> where we're going is kind of um, pretty rural. Is and it dark? It's going to be dark, yeah, because we're going to be starting after, mi after like 45 minutes after sunset. Gotcha. Um, so for maximum batness. <laughs> maximum batting. <is> <laughs> maximum like batting. Batness. And um, we're going to be showing everybody kind of how we do that. But oh, cool. we have to get there first. So we're on um, our way. Then enough. we'll meet up with you all when we're getting ready to go batting. Awesome. Very Yay! good. We found the moon. And I guess if we are going batting, it needs to be dark. It's not quite there yet. So what's the plan? So we're going to get ready. Yeah. Because it is sundown. You can kind of yeah, see. Yeah, it's so pretty. Over there. We, so we're, where we are in Rockingham is lots of pine forests, the pine savanna. It's a gorgeous place. This is one of my favorite views right here. Look at that pine, all those pine forests. That's a great shot, Leslie. Yeah, so they call it the pine forest savanna because it, it's got all those pine trees, but it also has a, a lot of um, open air as well, or open ground in there. And it's just one of my favorite habitats. Such a beautiful so habitat. So pretty. So we're getting ready. We're gonna kind of get all of our gear going and then we'll be ready to go batting. Are you excited? I am so stoked. It's gonna be really cool to see it. It's gonna be neat. And this is your first year doing this with me. It so. is so exciting. Last year was Wendy. Mm -hmm. Hi, Wendy. We miss, miss you. you Wendy. No doubt. <laughs> I've got to be up till 1230 tonight. Where are you, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's get our started. Let's get our stuff and get yeah. started. Okay. I love it. All right, Steve. So. I'm we the camera. I know. Like Isn't this amazing, everybody? <laughs> I, since I'm kind of the one that has been doing this, this is my third year. Um, 
I had to put Steve behind the camera. So we did a quick tutorial and hopefully he'll do just great. So everybody talk about how wonderful Steve's camera <laughs> skills are. He, uh, he, needs, he needs that support. So what I have Steve is I have our kind of bin. We are Southern Piedmont. So there's um, all of the people that hand off these bin to each other. We're all part of Southern Piedmont basically. And um, because we're still doing this and we're um, in COVID, we do have a whole cleaning protocol for kind of, since we're, it's going between people's hands. So that's, that's a little bit new this year um, and last year. We actually did that last year too. So in this- Oh, you did? Yeah, we did. I mean, the COVID stuff, I didn't realize Yeah. That. Um, cool. One thing that's really great is our friends that um, help put this all together um, at Wildlife Resources, North Carolina Wildlife Resources, they give you like everything that you need to know and they make it so, since we only do it once a year, uh, two days once a year. It's really great that they have all the information in there. But this is all the stuff we're going to use. And a lot of it's technology that most of you probably know. So we have a tablet. Nice. On that tablet, we have the app that we're going to use. So the app that we're going to use is this eco meter. So once I have everything plugged in, then we'll be able to turn that app on. And you see we have our North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, who we are doing this project with. Um, or four, really, honestly. <laughs> we have a GPS system, which we're gonna turn on and put that on the front so that when they're collecting data, they'll also have the GPS coordinates as well. And then this is what we're gonna put on the back of our car as we're driving so people know that we are part of the survey and so they won't be like why is this person driving less than 20 <laughs> miles an hour um, they'll be able to say oh i see they're doing a survey with the north carolina wildlife resources commission then this is kind of neat so this is actually our route right here so when we go driving we have a very specific route that we have to take and it has where you're turning what the name of the street is it even has how many miles on that street that you're going so once we're driving my job is because i'm the kind of the person doing the tech and steve's the person driving uh, my job is to make sure he knows where to turn and he kind of watches the mileage with me and then on the back it actually shows us what what our, our whole entire route is gonna be. And this will take us about an hour to get through because we are driving so slow. So, um, so it takes about an hour to get through that whole entire thing and it's under 20 miles total. So we'll have that. Then there's all of this information that we need if we need to kind of like figure stuff out. But um, in the back of it are our data sheets. So, let's show you our data sheets. This is the data that we're collecting today. Actually, let me show you the one that we did the other day. So, this is our data sheet from the other night. We actually came and did this on the 15th as well. We had to collect what time the sunset was, what our grid and where we are driving is. And then we have to do when we start, the temperature, what the wind speed is, what the humidity, can you see the moon? And then we estimate the cloud coverage, which tonight is gonna be 0%. You, <laughs> and then kind of what the moon looks like. And all this stuff is really important. We do this the same week every year roughly the same time, the 45 minutes after sunset. So we can get the most, uh, the least amount of variables. So we're trying to get it all in kind of that, that time and place and same route so we can have the not too many variables into this research. And so we put when we start and then we write all of that for when we end as well. And then so we'll do another sheet tonight as well. All right, and then the star of the show <laughs> is this right here, this tiny little red thing. This is the Ecometer Touch 2 from Wildlife Acoustics. This is what we're able to use to hear the bats. So we take the Ecometer and it is, has a cord from it. We'll plug it into the iPad or the tablet. It doesn't have to be an iPad, that's just what we have. Um, and then we kind of get that so that it's attached to this little suction cup thing. And then it'll go 
right on top of there. And this is a Steve's job because he's the tall one. So it's very nice to have tall people with you. Yeah, but So it will stick right up there. And as we drive, it'll get every animal or every um, bat, because it is specific for bats, um, it'll get their voices on, their voices, <laughs> on uh, registered on our tablet. And it's pretty cool to see. I can't wait to show y'all some of those. So, so that is how we're going to get everything started. And we'll see you while we're, or do you have any questions, Steve? Or? I was going to say, you no. Know, so you guys have done this. Y'all have done this now. This is your third year. Right. Um, is there really a goal? I mean, the Wildlife Resource Commission, one of our wonderful partners is doing this. Um, why here all the time? Why? What's the yeah? Of here? So the goal is we need as much information as we can about bats, especially certain times of the year, because we just don't have a lot of that information. And the acoustic study is being done all about the same time all across North Carolina. Oh, there is? Okay. Yeah, so nice. there's, like I said, we're Southern Piedmont, there's Northern Piedmont, there's several out in the coast, there's several in the mountains, and then all of our information goes together, um, and then they, they research what's going on, and then they can tell if there's gonna be a certain species of bat that's there normally, and getting that kind of baseline is gonna help us as we continue this research, because this is a long-term research. So when we said, hey, we'd love to be part of this and we'd love to go out and do this acoustic study, they asked us, is this something you're willing to do for years? And we said, yes, we are willing to do this for years. So, um, you know, when you and I retire, we may have to pass it <laughs> off <laughs> to um, to the people that take our place. That's but, uh, so yeah, so it's to learn about patterns, It's a learn about th what the amount of certain species if we have certain species of concerns in areas nice. and then we can kind of decide how to continue that research and what exactly we need to find so Very cool. wow. yeah and bats are super important because they're great at pest control. So thank you bats for eating all of those mosquitoes, <laughs> right? right? What is it, a thousand an hour? A thousand yeah, an hour I mean, inside. just amazing. Yeah, <laughs> and the bats that we have in North Carolina are insectivores. So they are eating those um, insects. So we're yeah. very thankful for them. So yeah, so yeah, bats, mosquitoes. amazing. And um, being able to hear them out in the wild and kind of all that stuff is just so much fun. So let's start to get ready. The sun's getting ready to go down. Yeah, we're gonna get- He's getting stuff ready. Yeah. See what I could do? Show you the sun going down. <laughs> My camera skills are not left for me. Not pretty. One more shot of the moon. That was crazy. Wow, we have made it to the internet. <laughs> Whole nother world for us right now. We're meeting with you again in the virtual, virtual The vir world? Virtual what? on virtual on virtual world. Yes, we have a guest. <laughs> My name. Let's, let's introduce our guest. All right, friends, so we're here with Becky Skiba. Hi, Becky. And, um, <laughs> She is a coastal education specialist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. I did it! The heck of a I title. know! Title. Title. Awesome job. Say hi to Becky, everybody. Digital friends, say hi to Becky. 
very, very happy to have her. And Becky, you're coming to us from where again? Um, from just outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. Awesome. Very good. This is so exciting. Uh, this yeah, is thanks for having me. Yeah, I wish <laughs> I wish I was outside of Wilmington right now. So I, I was I'm very jealous of where, you know, you're stationed. So. <laughs> I'm busy. That's girl's not so bad. Yeah. But Wilmington is Wilmington. It's hard to hard to beat that. I just I have beach on the brain. So <laughs> <laughs> So Becky, what does the coastal education specialist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission do? Why are they why are you here today with our bat presentation? <laughs> yeah, so I, I wear a lot of hats basically and a lot of earrings. As you can see, I brought my bat earrings Those today. Are lovely. My best show. Yeah, they are lovely. Yeah. Um I'm not allowed to keep live bats. I don't know why, right? Permitting and all that jazz. But, um, but yeah, so I, I do a, a lot of educational programs, either it's outdoor programs such as birding or doing, you know, helping with bat acoustic monitoring with this uh, Anabat program, uh, different citizen science programs. I also teach curriculum based programs with the Project Wild Guides and that whole series Aquatic Wild, Flying Wild, uh, Growing Up Wild. And I have all of the coastal counties. So that that keeps me running um, pretty well. I think it's, it's about, it's over 30 counties, that much I know. I just stopped counting after 30. It's just more mileage on the truck. So, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, basically any kind of wildlife people are excited about, interested in, um, if there's any human wildlife interaction or potential conflicts, uh, those are things that we want to address and, and talk to the public about because we feel like our wildlife, our natural resources are our greatest asset here in the state, right next to the citizenry that we have. <laughs> Oh, that's a very sweet thing to say. Very kind. I like that. Very true. Yeah. So, um, and we are talking to you today, not just because of all the cool stuff that you do outside of the program that we are discussing for our zoo adventures today, but specifically to talk about um, this acoustic bat monitoring program that Steve and I have had the pleasure of being able to volunteer and be part of um, and kind of, you know, get people from the zoo involved in it too and learn more about it and our partnership with you all and then also with UNCG and, and all these other things. But it is now called NA Bat. But so can you kind of explain to us a little bit about the history of this program and what it does? Yeah, absolutely. So um, NA Bat, it was basically launched in 2015 as a collaborative long-term program. And it was designed to assess the status and trends of our bats in North America at a local, regional, and um, just larger range-wide scale. So we get a lot more data put into this giant database. Um, and that way we can kind of analyze what's going on, the movement of our bats, any changes in populations and species distribution, um, challenges, conservation challenges for our bat species. So the goals were to provide regular assessments on bat abundance and distribution, and these, um, it's basically used to inform forest management and other local and regional practices um, for best use policies for land as far as management and conservation in the future. And, um, yeah, and previously, so um, as you've already demonstrated how Annabat works as a, as a volunteer of the program, we've got it down to this tiny little plug-in that you put into a USB cord that hooks into your iPad or your tablet, and you just kind of drive a route. But beforehand, back in the good old days, pre-2015, we had um, these giant, they almost look like uh, Google Maps, um, you know, apparatus that you put on your car. Everybody would look around and be like, what is this? Happening, right? um, and we have those still. Um, they are still used on some mountain routes by uh, some of our bat technicians really? in our wildlife management division. But we also have them uh, using as uh, kind of a standstill acoustic monitor in specific areas if we want more long-term data in a spot that we know is, you know, has a pretty significant population, or just in general, just to keep the data current and consistent with where we're measuring. So, um, but Anabat is really cool because it is this national database. So it's North American bat basically. Um, and that it has 500 online registered users. And that data is collected, reported from uh, 49 US states, six Canadian provinces. So um, just to give you an idea, I know everybody's been talking about the COVID effect in terms of wildlife viewing and how we've noticed so much more and we've just enjoyed, you know, being outside and all the different wildlife we've come across. Just in 2020 alone, the Anabat database uh, increased from uh, close to 30,000 um, records to more than 44 million. Wow. 
Yeah, so that big jump basically occurred not only from COVID, but also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service asked people to enter data on three species that okay. were being assessed for uh, being listed under the Endangered Species Act. So those would be our tricolored bats, our northern long-eared bats, and the little brown bats. And so Anabat basically used those submissions to create detailed status and trend documents that the Fish and Wildlife Service is now using to make its listing decisions in terms of how are we going to work to conserve the species in the future. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> Being able but, to use this information to like help with trends or whatever, whatever we need to do to help the animals in the wild, basically. Absolutely. And this kind of citizen science pro uh, program is really just designed for you pretty much have direct input of data. Um, we do have bat biologists that review the bat calls that you take. So I'm sure you've uh, probably reviewed the process, but we're lucky enough in North Carolina that we have um, 50 routes that run throughout the state. And our goal is to get to 100. So we're trying to add routes as we get more equipment and volunteers interested. Um, there's a whole scientific method for what routes to add where and the distance and all of that. And of course, you have to deal with uh, geography as far as, you yeah. know, mountains and bodies of water and traffic and dead end roads and all of that stuff. But we have some fantastic volunteers that drive these routes uh, for two months out of the year. So it's June and July. They have a set window. Yeah, yeah, they have a set window. Um, um, it's usually a 10 day window that they're going to drive at least twice at night, um, 45 minutes after sunset to collect all this data. And basically what they're picking up are the foraging calls of our bats. So bats are also make social calls. They, um, they chit chat with one another and those kinds of things. But the foraging calls are using that echolocation to find their food. And then that's how we're able to record that driving at 20 miles an hour. And then we can put that in the app and upload it to the uh, the specific software that our biologists use. And from there, they basically determine what kind of species it is. So this project is not only, you know, a North American project, but even just within the state of North Carolina, we have it divided between the mountains and the Piedmont and the coastal regions um, in terms of the routes that we've run. And uh, another thing I'd like to point out, our volunteers go through a, a training and orientation process mm -hmm. so that they know how to handle the equipment and they've, you know, and so that way it's, it's kind of like a, we're building a sense of community. We want to make sure that they can look out for one another and help our new volunteers get settled in. And, and, uh, and like I said, we just really, we really couldn't do this project without the volunteers that we have. And this is also kind of a partnership within the Wildlife Resources Commission because um, myself, our CC King, our regional um, education specialist in the Piedmont and Tanya Poole, our regional education specialist in the mountains. Um, we all kind of coordinate volunteers and get them together and start getting them their kits and the information that they need and working with them throughout the June and July season for collection of data. Um, and we're part of the wildlife education division. So we get to oh, meet wonderful. a lot of fun people through a lot of our <laughs> workshops that we do. And so that enabled us to help our bat biologists who are in our wildlife management division so that they can get all of this extra data, but they just didn't have the people that were trained and able to get out there. So like right, I said, yeah. this, is, this is impossible to do without volunteer help. We have some pretty amazing digital friends out there who are very passionate about animals. I'm talking to you all digital friends, wherever you are out there. <laughs> so they're very passionate, they're very exciting and they're, they're, they love sharing and being part of. So, so being, being one of these bat citizen scientists is not out of the realm of possibility for them. They could get involved with this program yeah, absolutely. So uh, it has been extremely popular. And as I said, we are trying to add new routes as we can make space for having enough equipment to actually have it out there since everybody right. once you have a new route, we have to assign it to a very specific one week period. And then every year it has to be that same week regardless because that is what helps the data keep its integrity. So um, we actually are comparing apples to apples. And um, so we're hoping to continue to add more. But sometimes, you know, our volunteers, we try to um, if you've already done it, we try to give you a chance to say, hey, would you like to do this route or would you like to change routes for the next season? Sometimes people have other commitments and they can't make it, but then also we're always expanding. So we train backup volunteers and we had to utilize probably 10 different backup volunteers this year alone. Oh, cool. um, yeah, but we also added some new routes as well. So things happen and, um, you know, it's it's we're always and we're also working on ways to keep our volunteers or, or people that are interested in our Anabat program. Um, we're, we're looking for some kind of volunteer development outside of actually running the survey. So whether those are going to be, um, you know, just 
question and answers with some of our bat biologists, whether it's going to be an opportunity, you know, post pandemic to attend uh, bat mist netting to see them up close with researchers right. that have the right shots to handle them or, you know, quite possibly it could be um, you know, doing <clears throat> doing some monitoring in the fall or different periods of time, spring, where we have bats oh, migrating, but it's not necessarily within that summer window or still surveys. So we're working out a lot of different possibilities. So even if you don't get an antibat route itself, we're still trying to find ways for you to be able to contribute data to this project. That's awesome That's cool. because, That's really yeah, like um, I, it's people are kind of always trying to get out there, I think, and we know a lot of people, especially our visual guests who are coming here trying to learn about animals. We know we need the help with animals, but how do I actually get out there? How do I actually do it? So it is really awesome that we have all these different things. And then you also said in multiple different states, because we actually have lots of digital guests that aren't just from North Carolina. So they could potentially, if somebody from a different state was interested in it, they could go to NA Bat or North America Bat and see if potentially they could help out in their state too. Is that correct? Uh, Illinois, New York friends out there, come on, come <laughs> yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, they they can. There's actually if you if you look up N N A Bat, um, you'll get up to the website. That's the national database, and they actually have hub contacts. So you can contact them. And be like, hey, oh, cool. I'm looking to volunteer. Just shoot them an email, and they can send you to the right person. Um, you know, or specific states depending on who they're partnering with. But I imagine that most of them are partnering with whoever the um, main wildlife management um, agency is in the state. So it might be a Department of Natural Resources, might be something, you know, pretty much along that vein. But yeah, you can always reach out and uh, just be patient. You know how, you know how us folks are about email, but we, we get to it as fast as we possibly can. Um, and a lot of, like I said, these programs, the Anabat program with the driving we run in the summertime, um, you know, the, the timing of it and the other types of projects that you might be able to get involved in may yep. fall outside of that window. So just contact that agency and they'll let you know what they have available. I love that. That's great. Absolutely awesome. Great that we can give our our digital friends some uh, call to action. Yeah, how to how to do it? Um, the scientists. Yes, exactly. So, Becky, we we've talked a lot about the bat program and everything like that. But why bats? Why are bats important? I love bats. Steve loves bats. A lot of us love bats. But can can you kind of give us a reason as to why bats are so such great animals? Basically, why they're important to the environment. Oh yeah, absolutely. So if you have to move past the intrinsic value because they're here, they're valuable and they sure. they are here because they do provide pretty vital ecosystem services. Um, they provide pest control, which is extremely helpful. Uh, anybody anywhere, not even just the South, um, can appreciate that bats can eat um, a significant amount of insects a night. In fact, sometimes uh, one single bat can eat, you know, over a thousand insects a night. So that's pretty significant right there. But it's not just mosquitoes. It could be, you know, grain moths. It could be, um, you know, leaf, let's see, like all kinds of, you know, just nighttime pollinators that we have out there. So they're going after all kinds of different uh, moth species. They're going after Japanese beetles. If anybody was wondering who actually eats those Japanese beetles, I mean, just basically, um, I mean, yeah, anything that's any, any kind of flying ant or beetle, um, you know, damselflies, dragonflies, leafhoppers. So they're, you know, they're, they're serving their role as far as trying to keep those booming populations down or at least in check. Um, you know, and they're also in different parts of the world, bats are pollinators. So we have bats that are oh, you know, right. insect eaters. Yeah, so our bats in North Carolina are all insectivores. We don't have the blood sucking bats. You have to go to Central and South America for that kind of tourism. So, but, or the um, North Carolina Zoo. <laughs> yeah, or there you go, good plug. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, that's where you keep them in containment there, but, um, you know, but in other parts of the world, we have fruit eating bats, so, you know, especially like in Laos, Cambodia, that particular area over there, so they do aid in pollination and uh, seed dispersal as well by spreading that, so they're really important as well for our global biodiversity and just overall ecosystem health. They make it a more robust and healthier system simply because they they do help add species richness to that kind of component. And, um, you know, many bat species have actually adapted to living safely alongside um, humans in both rural environments and in urban environments. And so that's kind of some of the interesting data that we have from Anabat as well, because we have transects that run right along, you know, cities or areas that are a little bit more populated with, with uh, people and buildings and that sort of thing. Some that run near farms and then some that are way, way, out and in the boonies out there you know um but yeah but I mean they, they've learned to you know adapt to the food sources that we provide in our gardens and 
places in our parks and even roosting around our homes. So they're pretty beneficial neighbors, but just, um, you know, just in terms of being good neighbors to bats, I mean, there are over 200 species of bats that are actually on the, on the threatened list. Uh, so they're struggling, but wow. 67, yeah, 67 plant families actually rely on bats as either their major or their exclusive pollinator. So, Ooh, wow. you know, when we're talking about species richness, it's not just in terms of I'm here, I count. It, they're actually helping our, our plants and things like that, um, you know. And I can't even imagine how that, how that account, how convoluted that might get over time if if it's the plants and the bats and what other plants are those are animals relying on that bats are pollinating mm -hmm. so who knows how yeah. that snowball uh, is is grown or impacted right and with that biodiversity too and that kind of that adaptation you know, co you know evolution over time essentially where they're like okay you scratch my back I'll scratch yours kind of thing you just figured out what's easiest for them you know I mean but um so it says that over uh, on the uh, Bat Conservation International site, I found these stats. So if anybody wants to verify them, I'm not just spitting them out there. But there, there are over three. <laughs> so there are over three thousand species of plants that actually rely on bats for seed dispersal, um, including pioneer plant species. But if if that's not enough to just really get you excited about bats, if you're more on the economist side. Um, there are um, 20, more than $23 billion in agricultural and human health savings for the planet every year based on the services that bats provide by eating bats. insects. So, I mean, yeah. that's pretty significant impact on our Ooh. economy right there. So, awesome. I would have not thought about it on the money side of things. Thanks for that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Put it in yeah. Another way for us to understand what they're doing. They're not just getting rid of some of the pests. They're making sure that there's jobs and opportunities to have money and stuff. That's a really cool thing, way to think about it. And there are only flying mammal, our only true flying mammal. I know a lot of people are like, oh, they're just rats with wings, but there's so much more. They're so much more complicated. We have bat species that have twins every time. I mean, we, we, you know, it's just the, the variety in and of our bat species. They're just very diverse. And um, I, you know, we have some that have the big ears and some that have the small eyes and then some with the big teeth. And it's just some that have a big wingspan, some that could fit, you know, in, on your thumb. So, I mean, just a great diversity of bats depending on where they live. So, it's just something to really be appreciated for sure as far as adaptations, but also just you just never can learn too much about bats. <laughs> I, th I think Becky likes bats. Mm -hmm. I think Becky one, likes bats just a little. I will say one of my favorite facts about bats is got? um that the world's smallest mammal is a bat. It is the bumblebee bat. And it is, yep, the size of like your thumb, basically. Yeah. Pretty I think it weighs like as much as a penny or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Grams, <laughs> my friends. There you go. And I think on the quarter, I think on the 2020 quarter, it was a bat. So if you have any quarters around, I know we're in a coin shortage, but check it out. You can oh, see that. Yeah. Digital friends, there's an activity for you. Can you find a quarter with a bat on it? What go. else you got? So a, uh, a question also. From this information, have you found any like neat or cool Ooh, stuff on, over man. the past several years from this this acoustic bat monitoring program? What you got? Yeah, absolutely. So with 2021 being the sixth year that we've basically been working um, with Anabat, we've actually um, we found so we've increased our roots in the coast. Um, and we have always had a lot of coverage in the mountains. So that's been the primary area because of all the caves and the roosting areas and that sort of thing. Sure. When white nose syndrome hit, which is absolutely devastating, there are several species that are impacted by white nose syndrome. And um, that is a, a horrible fungal uh, disease basically that has knocked out over 90% of some of our bat species populations. Yeah. And yeah, so um, they've increased the, because we have more volunteers and people, um, the amount of roots and kind of coverage in the, in the Piedmont and the coast. And because of that, uh, they've actually, our biologists have detected a group of little brown bats that have been found consistently across the years in the northern coastal region. So that's kind of the area of east of I-95 and north of uh, 64. So I'll give you an idea, but they didn't have a record of little brown bats in that area before that, oh, but wow. it may have been because we weren't doing this, we didn't have the survey efforts, but we do now, but it could be other factors, so we're continuing to watch it, but, you know, little brown bat is also one that can be affected by white nose syndrome, so that's, that's pretty hopeful, um, but, you know, I mean, we're just, we're starting to notice um, bats in areas that we didn't previously think that we had, oh, good. Um, so that is cool, but one thing that we are noticing is that, uh, 
the species diversity of bats in the mountains and the coastal regions are starting to become more and more similar to the Piedmont where we don't have very many species. So overall, uh, we're noticing that species diversity is declining um, in, in North Carolina. And generally that's probably due to losing habitat uh, where the more unique species um, that have spe specific habitat requirements just can't find what they need here, so. Oh, Interesting. That's good, so, that's good information. yeah, great information. And, and that kind of plays into the last question that I have for you was, you know, we we gave our digital guests and hope uh, anybody else who sees this, um, if they want to be part of this kind of bat monitoring, it's pretty amazing or other things. Um, but if somebody's like, I don't have the time to be able to volunteer or this is something that maybe I can't fit into my schedule. What are some other ways that people can help bats? <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, I mean, the very first thing I would think is, you know, be able to do your homework and your research. Bat Conservation International is a very um, revered site, has great information, and it's not just bats in North America, it's worldwide, and it's international. Yeah. So, they have a lot of news stories on there, updates, really cool facts and things on there, but also ways that you can help in networks and things that you can join um, where you are. So two of the things I know that they really um, try to push because again, our bats are struggling. The, first, the number one cause um, is going to be loss of habitat. So no matter where you live, development is happening. I mean, you know, I'm filming from my house. So I'm part of the, I'm part of it, but you know what I mean? We all need a shelter. We haven't adapted as well as our bat friends have, but um, <laughs> one way that you can help bats is you can use your acres, use your yardage to kind of plant some uh, plants that are gonna attract nighttime pollinators. And every time I say that people think, oh, this has gotta be that ugly plant from, you know, like, what is it, Dennis the Menace that only blooms once in a million years or something like that, but they're not. There's just really beautiful trees and all kinds of perennials and annuals and things that you can plant in your garden that bloom um, in the early evening and some in different oh, yeah, seasons and that sort of thing, but that will attract nighttime pollinators like moths and other beetles and many others that are gonna actually feed our bats. So, you know, I know a field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. If you feed them, they will line up, right? So just <laughs> try to plant some things that's gonna attract their food source. Um, and also if you can build a bat house or purchase a bat house Ooh. that's been put together, um, that's another way. So. Um, I will tell you, if you go to um, birding shops and places like that, they do carry what they call bat boxes, but buyer beware. Um, you want to have about an inch worth of space for the opening because bats are small. Our bats are small here. And they, they want to like kind of, they go in there to snuggle and kind of cuddle up. So they don't want a lot of air moving up and down because they want that temperature consistent. So you want to put your bat house south, southeast facing. And the sweet spot for height is usually about 12 to 20 feet. Anywhere up there that high is going to be good because when the bats fly down, they don't just go and hit the yard or your tree or your fence or whatever you have. It makes it harder for squirrels and snakes and you know other things to get up in there. But um, that way they get that morning sun. And then when the temperature drops, they know it's time to go out and eat. And then hopefully they're going to go out and grab all those uh, mosquitoes and everything else that's out in your yard. Um, and great. that leads me kind of to another thing. Um, if you can lighten up on the use of insecticides or pesticides, maybe have some other plants. If there's an area in your backyard or your porch or anything that you gather around, get some of those more aromatic plants that every time you walk by and you like rosemary and others, um, you know, lemongrass, that you just touch it. Every time you walk by, you just kind of touch it, it releases those oils. And that's what's going to keep those insects from hanging around your area rather than just treating your yard and killing basically a food source for or, um, for them, you can just kind of be like, here you go, I'm gonna push them towards you. Um, so yeah, that and dispelling myths about bats and, you know, just educating, educating others about bats. So those are, those are all really, really great ways to be yes. a bat steward. Yes. Digital friends, bat stewardship. That's a great mm -hmm. phrase, Becky. Thank you for that. And I'm uh -huh. sure that our digital friends would love to be a bat steward as they can, either producing an action, doing something to their house, or just sharing the wonderfulness um, that is a bat. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Thank you so much for hanging out it's with us so today, Becky. It's been so much fun to meet you. It's yes. been great. We, we had a great time. I know it unfortunately is just virtual, but uh, it still allows us to connect and kind of learn more about why bats are so awesome and, and things like that. Maybe we need to go to Wilmington one day. I think maybe we should cut. We should, we need to come down there one yeah. day, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me know. I'll take you out for some good seafood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Becky, thank you so very much. Digital friends, please give Becky a thank you if you don't mind right now. I know they're giving you some waves and they're giving you some claps. And there's some amazing friends that we have in the digital world. Becky, we can't wait to talk to you again soon. We'll see you later. Hang in there. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Well, Steve. Yes. How was your first batting experience with me? For not what I was expecting, it was really <laughs> a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. That was cool. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, and to actually hear and yes. see those echoes, that was awesome. That was very cool. That was neat. And that we'll eventually get all the information back to kind of know who we saw or heard during our roots. But next year, up for it again next year? Absolutely. Yeah. That would be exciting and really cool. And maybe, maybe. Some of our digital guests, maybe some more thinking about getting involved as well. Oh, yes. It was so fun talking to Becky about, yeah. you know, the whole entire history, why it's so important, and also how anybody can get involved with helping our wonderful oh. bats, because we want to help bats because they help us, right? And I, I love this. North Carolina Zoo getting involved as well with bats. And where uh, Mindy started was a bat house here at the North Carolina Zoo. And talk about the how and the why here at Streamside. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, well, thank you so yeah. much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Now that was a fun invitation. I wasn't expecting. It was a really good time. <laughs> All right, Zoo Adventures guests, so much. So good to see you guys one more time. Thanks for tuning in mm -hmm. today to your Zoo Adventures world. Today, Leslie was in front of the camera. So was Steve. And Mindy was Hello. behind. Thank you very much, Mindy. <laughs> Digital friends, stay safe. We can't wait to see you at the North Carolina Zoo in the future. Bye, everybody. Bye.